Hi guys and welcome back. In today's case, we will be looking at Austria's Favoriten girl murders. The case centers around a young woman and two children who were brutally murdered in the 80s and 90s and whose murders were long believed to be connected. This case was among the most extensive and costliest investigations in Austrian crime history. So let's have a look. Alexandra Schriefel was a 20-year-old outgoing girl who lived in Vienna's Favoriten district. She was employed at a clothing boutique in the heart of Vienna and was said to have enjoyed her job very much, always being praised for her work ethic by clients. Being such a friendly and warm-hearted girl, she was naturally adored by friends and family alike. In her free time, as is typical with many young people, Alexandra would often visit nightclubs and dance the night away with friends. On October 25, 1988, a female friend of Alexandra's asks her whether she would like to tag along with her that night to a nearby nightclub called Azzurro. The club, which was based on the southern outskirts of Vienna, was a favorite of Vienna's young at the time and Alexandra would often visit. To paint a picture, the club was located next to two restaurants, which were also well visited at the time, as well as a cafe with a bowling alley. I have looked the club up, however, I don't believe that it still exists today, or perhaps it has simply been renamed. Either way, Alexandra agreed to go with her friend, as the following day was Austria's national day, meaning she had no work. Alexandra had been friends with Werner, who worked as a precision mechanic, for many years. But her friend didn't always accompany her on her nights out, as she also enjoyed spending quality time just in the presence of her girlfriends. Whenever she needed a ride, however, she'd always rely on Werner. And that was also the case that night, as Alexandra gave Werner a ring before leaving for the club. At around 10 p.m., she arrives at the club with her girlfriends and spends a few hours there dancing and chatting away. At around 2.30 in the morning, she tells her girlfriend that she'd gotten tired and she was leaving to go home. Her friend asks her how she'd get home and she assures her friend that Werner was reliable and he'd pick her up as usual. As she heads outside, she calls Werner from a telephone box across the road. He tells her that he will leave immediately to come get her. He also tells her to wait right there and not go anywhere else as it's dangerous for a lady to be outside alone at night. However, it seems that Alexandra doesn't quite follow his advice, as she decides to leave the phone box and walk off. It was later assumed that she might have headed his way, so they could meet halfway. As she walks off, she is seen by a driver who was driving past the club. The driver would later say that a little way behind the club, he noticed three young men trailing behind a blonde woman. Police later assumed that this blonde woman was Alexandra. Soon after she is spotted, Werner arrives at the meeting point only to realize that Alexandra had already left. He then drives back and looks for her on the way home, but he doesn't find her. The next afternoon, Alexandra is found not far from the club behind a billboard at Himberger Strasse during a search operation. She had been found tied naked to a tree with her stockings and jumper. Alexandra had been raped and strangled. Two gold necklaces, one of which featured an eagle, and a brown and blue handbag had not been located. In the subsequent investigation, there were several suspects, hundreds of people were questioned over the weeks, but the police could not find one significant lead. This was 1988 and DNA tests hadn't been around yet, police instead solely relied on blood tests, and so the case quickly went cold. Three months following the murder of Alexandra, another murder shocked the district of Favoriten. This time, it was the murder of a child, 10-year-old Kristina Beranek. On 2 February 1989, at around 4.45 pm, Kristina leaves her school with a friend. They both head home on a regional bus. Both kids lived at the Per Albin Hanson Siedlung, only a few bus stops away from their school. A few meters from the residential complex where they both lived at the time, Christina said goodbye to her friend. She had intended to drop by a local tobacco shop and pick up her Mickey Mouse magazine. Her grandmother had previously bought her a magazine subscription for Christmas. At 5 p.m., she leaves the shop in what would be her last sighting. In the meantime, her mother and 14-year-old sister had been waiting for her to come home for dinner. By 6 p.m., she had still not arrived home. Slowly getting worried, her mother and sister leave their apartment to go look for Christina in the apartment complex, but they don't find her. When her father returns from his night shift, he too walks around the building looking for her. As he reaches the 14th floor, the highest floor, 
he looks up and sees Christina. She had been raped, strangled with her pantyhose, and tied to the railing. As Christina's murder took place a mere hundred meters from where Alexandra was killed, and in such a similar way, it didn't take long for investigators to conclude that this could very well be the same perpetrator. What followed was the largest police operation the district had ever seen. Some 200 officers were on duty at the same time, and Austrian criminologists even reached out to Germany for help in the search for clues. They suspected that the perpetrator came from the area, which had around 11,000 citizens at the time. Police spoke to some thousand people and examined over 500 apartments, while offering a reward of 160,000 shillings, so around 12,000 euros today. During investigations, seven suspects were initially questioned, with none other than Alexandra's friend Vanna, who was 20 at the time, being the main suspect. It was revealed that in the past, Vanna had sexually assaulted nine girls in the area. The police disclosed that Vanna had no alibi for the first night of the murder. However, a later blood sample revealed that his blood type wasn't a match. Alexandra's murderer had blood type A and his was O. Additionally, he was able to provide a solid alibi for the night of the crime in the case of Christina, so he was ruled out as a suspect. However, before the police could catch the killer, a third murder occurred. On December 22, 1990, around 5.30 pm, 8-year-old Nicole Strau was on her way home from her aunt's place at Simmeringer Hauptstrasse after she went there to pick up Christmas gifts. She had gone home via tram line 71 and then changed to bus 15A, but after that, her trail was lost. Police presumed that she ran into her perpetrator on the way home by chance. She was found the next day at around 10.20 a.m. in Austria's Lair Forest. The forensic examination determined that Nicole had been raped and killed with a broken branch after her perpetrator had tried to strangle her with her shoelaces and failed. However, as before, in Nicole's case too, no significant leads surfaced, despite the police investigating more than 1,600 people. The suspicion of dealing with a serial offender was thus confirmed, and this is a theory the police would run with for a long time. For a decade there would be no progress in the three cases, given the very limited resources at the time. When the DNA database was finally introduced on October 1, 1997, Alexander Schriefel's DNA was among the first to be included. The only thing missing now was a sample from a suspect. Then, in 2000, a match was found. That year in September, Herbert Petsch, born in 1968, was involved in a brawl and attacked the intervening police officers. He was then arrested. At the time, it was customary to take an oral cavity swab from suspects for this class of offenses. Three weeks later, a DNA match was made to Alexandra's case. Herbert was then arrested on October 1st on suspicion of murder, but Herbert wasn't new to this case. He was actually among the first suspects questioned after the night of Alexandra's murder in 1988, but due to a mistake at the Forensic Medical Institute in Vienna, an incorrect blood type was determined and he was eliminated as a suspect. The police had questioned 3,300 people at the time. Herbert, who had been known to police for years, claimed that he was innocent. According to him, the sexual intercourse between Alexandra and him was consensual. He also stated that he had only known Alexandra very briefly, but confirmed that he was at the same club that night. On December 11, 2001, Herbert was then arrested and sentenced to 15 years imprisonment, but he was spared a maximum sentence which would have been 19 years due to being under 21 years old. He appealed his sentencing on June 13, 2002, but to no avail. Due to the similar nature of the two murders, tying victims by their own clothes was then seen by criminologists for the first time in Europe, Herbert was subsequently charged for Christina's murder, however, due to the lack of evidence, this charge was dropped. A criminal psychologist and a public prosecutor later testified that they are 100% certain Herbert, who was also seen in the area where Christina was murdered, is guilty of the killing. In Nicole's case, the police turned their attention to the 25 closest suspects tied to her case, asking each of them to provide a DNA sample. Only one of them, known criminal Michael Petzl, born in 1966, could not be located. At the time of Nicole's murder, 
Michal was involved in an affair with her married aunt, who gave him an alibi. On September 27, 2001, he was then located by police and arrested in his home. Michal refused to testify and to give a DNA sample, much like he did back when he was questioned in the 1990s. This time, however, he was ordered by a judge to give a sample, which was applied in spite of his persistent refusals. On November 28th, he was then linked to Nicole's murder via his DNA and subsequently given a life sentence. Quite shockingly, Michael later went on to give an interview from prison on his life and Nicole, saying that she was a good girl and that he would often play with her. He reportedly broke off all contact with Nicole's family following her murder, saying that her parents' suffering would depress him too much. He also shared parts of his past life, but I will spare you the details, as this man doesn't deserve more airtime. Meanwhile, Nicole's parents have stated that they are relieved that the perpetrator was caught in the end, as this could save many girls' lives. And while I agree, I just wish that when questioned, as both these murders had been, the police would do a better job of taking DNA samples and putting them behind bars the first time. In Christina's case, nobody has been officially charged, but I think it's safe to say that the majority of people hold Herbert accountable. And that concludes today's case. As always, thank you for watching and let's meet again on the next one. Bye for now!